Mensah Mao. Good morning, Mr. Petwell Henry. Today we are very blessed and fortunate to have you to share with us your experience in both education and as a leader in Micronesia. So the question we'll be asking today are questions that have been compiled by our History of Micronesia and Reading class. Okay, so if, if we're ready, we're going to move ahead with our first question. Okay. Well, thank you very much for this opportunity, <laughs> for this meeting. I heard uh, the arrangement and I was looking forward to it. So thank you for having me. Thank you, Mr. Henry. So given the information that was provided to our students, the students are very curious to know, given the extensive background, mm -hmm. you had both experience in te being a teacher, working with the education system, and later on beca you became a very prominent leader in Micronesia. So can you tell us a little bit more about your education, especially on whether you went to school before or after World War II? Yes, so, okay. My education was all mixed up. <laughs> I went to school during the Japanese time, one year, when the war got to here. So I st all schools were stopped. And after the war, we started school again, and I went to elementary school in Mokilla. Then from that time I came to, from, from there I came to Ponape, attended what they call teacher training school, which was attended by several uh, people who became leaders in Ponape. And then uh, when intermediate school started in 1949, I was one of the students there. So for one year, then I went to Hawaii I attended the Pacific Institute High School for two years. In those years, uh, you, when you go outside to attend school, you have to be, you have to return after two years because our head of education uh, felt that a Micronesian being outside of Micronesia too long can forget his culture. Mm -hmm. So that was his policy. We had to come back after two years. So after two years, I came back. Uh, it, I was with Koso Yamata, who was also, we went to Hawaii, Hatan with Pacific, after one year Pompey working, then we went back again to high school, attended Lahaina Luna High School in Maui. And then from there we went to university, so then we came back, and of course then we started working. In 1959, I came back to Pohnpei. I was, that year I, I attended the trusteeship council in New York. I was selected to represent trust territory or Micronesia as what they call advisor to the high commissioner. Micronesian advisor to the high commissioner. Uh, in, in, at that time, high commissioner would appear before the trusteeship council, every once every year, after a team of uh, UN trusteeship council members come out and inspect our trust territory, what the U.S. was doing, and then went back. And during the summer, the high commissioner would go back and testify. And and so he started having one Micronesian to accompany him, as what they call. My Kunishan advisor. The first advisor was uh, the mayor, Elias Saplan, mayor of Saipan. Second was uh, Mrs. Amata Kabua's mother, who is a Leroj, traditional leader from the Marshall. I was the third person, very young, <laughs> enjoying the trip. How old were you? I was 1959, you minus 34, uh, so I was <laughs> very 20 <young>. some. Very <laughs> Anyway, so I was enjoying the trip. In 1959, I was in New York as my clinician advisor. I gave a speech. Then I came that year. I was not in Pohnpei. They elected me as president of what was called the Congress of Pohnpei District. Pohnpei District, uh, so-called legislative bodies, 
I say so-called because they were really, they didn't have actual legislative authority. Uh, the first so-called legislative party in Pompeii that was established by the U.S. was uh, called uh, Ponape Island Congress, which consisted of two houses, Iman Aramas or Iman Sobeiti, House of People, Common People, and House of so the Traditional Lords or so Leaders. So uh, after a while, 1959, they did away with that island congress and created a legislative party for the whole district of Pompeii, including the outer island, which Kushai was one of them. So that was created in 59. Bailey Ulter was the first president of that body. He was going to school and I was coming back, so they elected me as president of Pompeii District Congress in 1959. So I became the president of that body, which included some of the real big leaders in Pompeii. Uh, many of them became non marquee or Nankan and other traditional leaderhood. So I, I served in that body. At the same time, I became a teacher at Pix. Pix moved from Pon uh, Chuk to Pompeii in 1959, mainly because Pompeii has water mm. and land. And so that school moved to Pompeii. That school consisted of, consisted of students, selected students from Marshall to Palau, including Saipan. And there were the whole student body was less than 100 students all over. Uh, I, I, I was a teacher there, so I taught for about 10 years. At the same time, I was also a member of the Ponape District Congress. Then we changed that to Ponape District Legislature. And then 1965, the Congress of Micronesia was created. I was one of the members from Phone uh, to that body. So if I may, uh, yes, given, given your experience as a teacher back then, mm. and you just mentioned that you taught for 10 years at the time, mm. you were also representing first Ponpe and then Micronesia. What was maybe a challenge or a significant difference that you saw between being a teacher in a classroom and being a leader representing first Pompeii and the rest of Micronesia. What was a challenge or what was a very major difference mm. between those two careers? I, yes. When I came back from uh, New York and became a teacher at Pix, some of the students, many of them became governors and speakers, legislature and leaders from all over, president of Marshall, president of Palau, uh, the current uh, what Attorney General, I think, of Palau. Anyway, uh, they asked me a question about, you know, what I did. And I think, uh, I think that, in a way, it helped me to know what they want. And also, I think, helped them. One of, the, one of them, this guy from Palau, when the student registered to become student in PEX, one of the questions that was asked was, what would you like to become? And that person listed down PhD. <laughs> no, he, he just started high school and he wanted to be a PhD. Yes. Yes. Well, now he's the Attorney General of Palau with about two degrees in yes. law. Yes. Uh, so I, I think it helped uh, not only sharing my experience, but also helping the student to yes. see the future or, or at least expect something from themselves. Thank you, Mr. Henry. Yeah. So, earlier you spoke about how when you were representing Pompeii, several changes were made, but especially to the two houses yes. that you mentioned. But if, we, if you were to reflect back on your yes. experience as a leader <clears throat> in the past and your observations of the modern government today, yes. I what think, differences do you see yes, between I, I, what used to be and what is today? Yeah, that's a very good question uh, because I think our political development uh, was happening at the time I was in and uh, many of the changes that were made were either 
uh, created by our administering authority, which was USA, mm -hmm. and also the input that was put on by people that were in the positions that I was mentioning, members of the legislature or members of the Congress. Mm -hmm. For instance, when we, when the administration uh, started Congress of Micronesia in 1965, mm -hmm. there were two houses, House of Representatives and House of the Senate. And uh, we were the first body in TTPI mm -hmm. to be given legal authority to make law. Mm -hmm. Of course, the High Commissioner from U.S. will have to be the final approval, but we were the first one. Uh, all the legislatures before us didn't have that authority. They, they, we just make resolution, and but Congress was the first. And uh, but at the same time, we were barred from making laws that were against U.S. law. So if we pass a law or propose legislation that was against U.S., that will automatically be dead. Okay, yeah, so point. we have to comply with what the interior was. So, and over the years, then there were changes that were made, and then, then, you know, that kind of restriction mm. was uh, taken off. And uh, also, when the trust territory was created, the call for the trust territory. As you know, there were trust, uh, 11 trust territories when the, after the Second World War. We, ours was one. And these trust territories, many of them were in Africa and some of them were in the Pacific. And ours was the only one called strategic trust territory because U.S. wanted it to be there because the atomic bomb was delivered from our area, you know, Tinian, and there were, many, many battles that took place. And uh, so we were different from the other trust territories. Our trust territory was the only one uh, whose final step, if we want to be independent or if we want to be whatever, that final step must be approved by the Security Council. The, Ten other trust territories, their final step would be approved by the General Assembly, so the which was much easier. Being which was uh, okay. That's a, because the Security Council, as what we call the, in the Security Council, are the big five. The big five, the five countries that won the Second World War, and they have, in the Security Council, what is called the veto power. Mm. So if one country says no. Then Nothing will happen. Legal. So for our trust territory, yeah. U.S. can block anything that happened. So that that was uh, ours was uh, the uh, only one that was like that. But in the end, in the end, I think through the work that we did and all that, uh, at the time when when we were approaching our final decision to become independent or free association. U.S. and Russia were were not not very good friends. Mm -hmm. Not Russia, but Soviet Union at the time. And then finally, the Soviet Union, because in the end of the trust territory was that we will is is spelled out in the trusteeship agreement. Am I am I going to? Okay. And in the trusteeship agreement, it says that we will be a trust territory until we decide what we will become. And what we will become, the trustee agreement says, independent or self-government. Independent or self-government. U.S. doesn't want us, I think, to become independent because that's why they created us to be strategic. So if, if I may ask mm, for yeah. clarification, at that time, what did they mean by the difference between independence and self-government? What was the difference? Yes. Who, who was to become independent and yes. who was yes. to become self-governing yes. yes. self yes. entity? Yes, yes, yes. 
you know, I, I, I think in my own interpretation, sub-government can be independent yes. or independent can be or yes. really yes. it's different from yes. sub-government because independent you become, you're on your own. You're not attached to anything. So what we become, in the end, free association is really maybe independent, maybe not independent. Eh? You know, so independent is to be on your own without the help of any or association of any other. What we have now is a is we call independent, but in free association with the U.S. So. So, so I meaning think there is still some relationship we between the We two still nations. have a very important relation with the U.S. With the US. Yes. Thank you. So earlier you mentioned something about how when the leaders in the TTPI Trust Territory for mm -hmm. the Pacific Islands came together to make laws, mm -hmm. they were also restricted or mm -hmm. they had to be mindful of yes. the U.S. laws. Yes. How yes. did you feel about that as a leader, being well, restricted? and also knowing that you had to, you were given the obligation to also make new laws? You know, that's a very good question, but I really didn't object to it at the time, because I think it was just part of the whole, what, what was going on. And, and, and then, thinking about our past, we really didn't have so much, any authority to decide for ourselves. So, to me, uh, or to us, we, we just, live with what we had. So what happened in those days, we passed many, many resolutions, but very few laws. Many resolutions, uh, complaining why UN is not doing this, why US is not doing this, just complaining, complaining, you know. Uh, maybe you might call that we were irresponsible. Uh, we, we didn't take care of our country. We just want to blame US for not doing this or these people were not doing that and not doing that. that so we were true, somewhat irresponsible. So <laughs> I, I think we became more responsible by yes. tackling these things. And so over the years, fewer and fewer resolutions complain yes. and more and more laws to establish uh, what we want, positive. what we should do, right? And I think that was natural because you were mm. leaders and concerned about your yeah, people yeah. and we your want, island. Yes, so given those obstacles, what did you find was the hardest part of being a representative? Well, I don't know that I would call it hard, but one, one thing that I found was that the people of TTPI, we, we had different ideas about the future. Yes. So how do we come together? That was, to me, the hardest part. As leaders of our Congress, we really try to do our best to keep the unity. But as you know, in the end, that unity is broken into several. We're still friends, but uh, but there is Palau, there is Marshall, there is FSM, and there is the Northern Marianas. So to me, that that's what, uh, maybe we didn't do a good job, but uh, I, I think we couldn't prevent uh, A lot of people split. would agree that you did a really good job. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> but then, which leads up to another interesting thing, which a lot of, I, I know that especially the young people, they're mm. very curious to know why eventually the TTPI broke apart. Was it, was it more of a cultural difference or just individual differences that the leaders had? You know, that's a very good question. Because when FSM started, we, of course, decided that our capital will be in Pohnpei. Mm -hmm. We met in Pohnpei, Congress of Micronesia, which included Palau, Marshall, all that. And it was in that meeting that we decided where the capital should be. Mm -hmm. We had a committee chaired by Congressman Raymond Satek from Chuk. They traveled all over and interviewed people and examined places. Where should the capital be? So they came up with all the thinking proposals, and then they make their recommendation. As you know, during the Japanese time, our capital was in Palau. In that report, it says, if the capital were to be in Palau, Marshall will really don't 
hate it because it's so far it's from the other side. Choose. So maybe it should be in Chuk because it's the center. U.S. had recommended, when Truman was president, he had recommended that U.S. spend millions of dollars to build Tupelon to be our capital. Mm -hmm. Well, that didn't come out, but during the German time, you know, our capital was in New Guinea. So the thinking that where should the capital be was a big issue. And in Pohn Bay, we voted. When we voted that the capital be in Pohn Bay, Palau delegation walked out of the meeting. Of course, we were, we, 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 we joke and laugh yeah. afterward, but that was how yeah. they want to show that uh, this is not what Palau wanted. Yeah. But I know Marshall would never like Palau to be capital because so far from Marshall to travel to Palau. Mm -hmm. So, uh, we, we, we selected Pohn Bay in that one. Mm. And then, uh, so, so those were some of the... Very interesting. Yeah, give and take things that uh, we had to do. Take. So I guess it's safe to say that part of the separation was also a geographic challenge. Yes, okay. Marshalls so, being yes, far yes, to the yes. east. Then. And then when we met in Pohn Bay for the first time, traditional leaders from Pohn Bay invited us. Toshiwa Nagayama was president, he's from Chuk. Yeah. Petrus Toon was vice president from Yap. Yeah. Joab Sikra was from Kosai, he was the vice speaker. Yeah. And I was from Pohnpei, was speaker. So the four states were represented in the congressional leadership. Yeah. And when we first met in Pohnpei, we were invited by the traditional leaders for reception with them. Yeah. And I remember one reception we had in U with the non Marquis of U, Johnny Moses. And uh, he made a statement which I cannot forget and relate to your question. He says that, you know, traditionally, these are the four areas that were families from way back. Mm -hmm. Kursai, Pohnpei, Chuk, and Yap. He said, my mother, my mother came from Yap. So I said, wow, well, well, which is mother? He said, that Kamsik, Kamsik or yes. Lututun yes. Yap? Kamsik, okay, <laughs> came from Yap. Eh? So anyway, this kind of thing also mm. came up. Man. We are, we were the one, we we're way back, we were, we're the family, mm. this group. Those others that put it out, yeah. they really not belong to our family. So mm. so anyway, those are, so some were some good, uh, common or co revelation to us that were in the Congress. Mm. Because we really work hard to to keep mm. the unity. We paid for leaders from Pohnpei to mm. travel to Marshall, Palau, Mar yep, to talk about mm. unity. But the end was what happened. So in speaking about unity and clashes between what used to be mm. the TTPI, mm. uh, Based on observations today, do you think that there is some tension or is there any clash between the traditional leadership system to the modern leadership system? Yeah, so the, I, I don't see that. Uh, but I think that, uh, however, there are some regrets that I know. Mm -hmm. For instance, Northern Marianas regretted that what they wanted at the time was to be U.S. citizen. Mm -hmm. Well, today they're really far from being U.S. citizen mm -hmm. and voting for the president or having a mem person from there in the True. U.S. Congress is uh, still far, 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 far away. Mm -hmm. And also one thing that we were talking about that they should, they could have at the time was to retain the 200 miles. There is the 200 miles economic zone that they could retain, yeah. but they said, no, who care for 200 miles? We want to be U.S. citizen. Yeah. Well, there is regret now. I heard from some of the leaders uh, that Very they should have retained that because yeah. when they had the opportunity, sure. now they can't. Mm. Thank you, Mr. Henry. Thank you very much. So given that we have so many young and aspiring leaders, what would be your advice to our young Micronesians who aspire to be involved in the functions of the leadership system, but most especially as they're aspiring to become leaders mm. in this nation. 
that we know today, the FSM, mm. what would be your advice? I think my advice, I will not hesitate to say, love your country. Love your country and make your contribution to have it a better place to live. Very general, but that really is what I think is more important than. <clears throat> and uh, listen to people and be humble. You cannot do on your own. You will have to have the assistance of others and be good. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you for your time, Mr. Thank Henry. You. We are much. honored to have you with us today. Well, thank you very much for having me. You make me feel younger, you know. <laughs>